Let's open our Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. This was a message that I had put together before I got sick. And I got sick Saturday afternoon. And it's the duty of joy. What a lot of joy in my house past few weeks. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Because of COVID, uh, current civil and political unrest, the godless flood of moral depravity and violence, and even the beginnings of Christian persecution in this country, many are saying that we are living in uncertain times. But the truth is this. Ever since the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden, the world has been an uncertain place to live, especially for the people of God. Not only do the people of God have to suffer through the things that are common to all people, such as sickness and disease, natural disasters, war, strife, and a whole host of other trials and tribulations, which finally culminate in death, God's people also have to suffer the ridicule, rejection, and persecution from a world that hates God. Jesus, in fact, tells us in John 15, verses 18 and 19, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world is not an easy place to live for anybody, but for those who follow Christ, the world can be an especially difficult place. But that does not mean that God's people have to live their lives crippled with fear and anxiety and a sense of hopelessness. On the contrary, as we'll see in our text for today, God commands His people to live their lives filled with joy instead of filled with fear, anxiety, and despair. And this state of joy that we are to live in as Christians is not a joy that is based on the circumstances of our lives, living in a fallen world. But rather, it is rooted in someone. And that someone is Jesus. Let's look at our text together. Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, the word rejoice is an imperative. That means that it is a commandment. And it's also in the present tense, which tells us that it is to be a continuous activity. So, what we read right off the bat in verse 4 is that the Word of God is commanding his people, Christians, commanding us to rejoice always in the Lord. And to make sure we get it, Paul repeats it. Again, I say rejoice. So if rejoicing to be filled with joy is a commandment of God, it is our duty to be joyful, to live each day rejoicing in the Lord. Now that seems odd because it's kind of hard to think about being commanded to have joy. How do you command someone to be joyful? How do you make someone rejoice? Especially when the world has fallen out from under them. One of the things that we need to note about the author of this letter, ultimately the author is God. 
The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write what he wrote in this epistle and all of his other letters, of course. One of the things that we need to note about the Apostle as he writes, commanding the church at Philippi to rejoice in the Lord always, is that Paul is writing from prison in Rome awaiting his own death, execution. Apparently Paul could find joy while he awaited execution. And if Paul could somehow find joy in a Roman prison, then to the Christians living at Philippi, who were suffering under the threat of persecution from the world, but also from false prophets within, surely they too could somehow find a reason to rejoice in the Lord. Now this again, this joy in Christ is not based on our circumstances. It has nothing to do with our circumstances. And that's saying a lot because circumstances can sure knock your feet out from under you. In quarantine, it felt really bad for a couple of weeks. There wasn't a, I, w I was trying to pray, I was, and I was reading my Bible, and I was trying to read other literature, but I just didn't feel good. It felt bad. And it was hard to have a joy, at least a spark of joy, even when I was you know, laying there sick. But it's a joy that's supposed to be beyond me having COVID. It's a joy that, that is beyond the circumstances that we face in life. And sometimes we, we can't find it. But it's there because it's in Christ. Circumstances can be very challenging, very difficult for us. But the bottom line is this. Circumstances are not greater than Christ in you. And your joy is in Him, not in your circumstances. It's a joy that transcends what we go through in life. It's a joy that is rooted in the one who has saved us, the Lord Jesus Christ. How could Paul rejoice awaiting execution? Because his joy had nothing to do with his circumstances. How could the Philippians be commanded to rejoice when they are facing persecution from the world in which they live, but also from false prophets from within, because their rejoicing was to be in Christ, not on their circumstances. How can we as Christians today find, find and have lasting joy amidst the difficulties of living in a fallen world? Because our joy is in Christ, not our circumstances. It is our duty as Christians, to rejoice through each and every circumstance we face. Because our joy is in Jesus, not this world. Now, the duty of joy, which is a commandment we are to fulfill, again, a joy not based on our circumstances, a joy that is based on the Lord, tells us this important fact about the joy we are to have. It is a supernatural joy. It is a joy that comes from outside of us, but also from within us through the presence of Christ. So when you are sick and laid up and you're finding it hard to have joy, or when you are just in a rut in your Christian existence and there's little joy in your life, if something is bringing you down, if the world is depressing you, if the fear of, of this world is creeping in on you, Know that your joy comes from without, but also from within. It comes from Christ. That's why it's not dependent on your circumstances. That's why there's something about the presence of Christ in your life that transcends the circumstances, that comes into your life and gives you that hope, and gives you that sense of peace, and that sense of joy that is so elusive in our lives. Joy is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit that God produces in our lives. In Galatians 5.22, Paul says that the fruits of the Spirit are these. Love, the second one is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In the Bible, the fruits of the Spirit are the very attributes of Christ Himself that the Holy Spirit supernaturally manifests in the life of a believer. So the love that we are to have as Christians is a supernatural love. 
The joy that we are to experience every day as Christians is a supernatural joy. The same about peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. These are all qualities and characteristics of Christ Himself that the Spirit of the living God in the life of a believer brings to bear in our day-to-day -day existence. Take the spiritual fruit of joy, for example. The Holy Spirit will manifest joy in our lives, and it's a joy, again, not based on our circumstances. It's a joy that we can cultivate through four areas of our Christian living. Working in harmony with the Holy Spirit through our relationships, our prayers, our thought life, and our obedience to the Word of God. It's so, alright, this is what we're going to unpack this is where the joy is to be found. This is how we cultivate this spiritual fruit in our lives. Verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Alright, so the first thing that we see here is how the duty of joy affects our relationships with other people. Especially those who stand opposed against us. The word reasonableness or moderation comes from a root word meaning to yield. And when Paul says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, he's saying, yield your rights to another person in this sense, by not demanding justice or your rights when you're offended. Wow. So in other words, Christians are to be known not for their vindictiveness, but rather for their humility, for their patience, for their forgiveness. It's kind of hard to rejoice always when all you can think about all day long is how you've been wrong and how you're going to get back at them. The church at Philippi needed to hear this because they were being persecuted from the world because of their faith in Christ. And then rather than letting the fear of persecution rob them of their joy or filling their hearts with anger and bitterness and an unforgiving spirit towards those who are persecuting them, they were to let their reasonableness be known to those who were persecuting them. To respond to the aggressiveness of a pagan culture that hates God and hates God's people in a Christ-like way with forbearance and forgiveness. The church at Philippi needed to hear that. We need to hear that today so that our lives are not turned into a cesspool of bitterness because of all that we are facing that is wrong in our culture. It's easy to get mad. It's easy to become filled with anger and frustration. Paul says, let your reasonable be known to all people. Be Christ-like in humility and in patience and in forgiveness. The answer then is not to take vengeance, but to be like Jesus. You see, we don't have to worry about justice when wronged. Christians never have to worry about justice when wronged. Because Paul says the Lord is at hand. And what Paul is talking about is the coming of Christ. And when He comes again, He will judge the world in righteousness. And justice will be served to every human being. Those in Christ whose sins are forgiven will not taste the wrath of God, but will be delivered from His judgment. Those, on the other hand, who do not know Christ will indeed face the wrath of God on that day. And on that day, justice will be served. So rather than worrying about our enemies, trust justice to Christ whose coming is at hand. Stop worrying. Start being Christ-like. And you will have joy in your life. And the second thing we need to do is pray. Look at verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. For all that makes us anxious in this life, we pray. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And the reason that we can take anything, whatever it is that is making us anxious, 
to the Lord is because the Lord cares for His own. Listen to 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. King James says, casting all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. The word care is anxiety. Whatever it is that makes us anxious, whatever it is that gives us fear and trembling, we are to take it to God in prayer. Because He cares for us. Now, by not doing that, by keeping all of our anxiety, we are saying that God doesn't care for us and that God doesn't have the power to help us. If we really believe that God cares for us, then we can take what makes us anxious to Him and know that He will take care of it according to His purpose. And a lot of God's purpose in our anxiety is to get us through it. Sometimes He delivers us out from it, but most of the time He takes us through it. And it is through the valley of suffering that we learn to trust Him. So we pray because He cares for us. We pray because He has the power to help us. And the result is the peace of God to those who pray. Look at verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you see what prayer does? Prayer brings something into our life that we need, and that is the peace of God. And Paul says it's a peace that is incomprehensible. It surpasses all understanding. It's a peace from God Himself. It's a supernatural peace. And it guards our minds and our hearts in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 26, verse 3, Thou will keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on Thee, because He trusteth, trusteth in Thee. Prayer to God keeps our hearts from corroding fear. And it keeps our minds from toxic, anxious thoughts. This duty of joy that is commanded by Christ, therefore, is cultivated by our relationships, how we respond to people, especially those who stand against us. And it's cultivated by our prayers to our Father. But there's two more things here that need to be addressed. And that is our sense of joy can be cultivated by what we set our minds on, and by our obedience to the Word of God. So let's look at the thought life in verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, commendable, if there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Set your mind on certain things. You see, the thought life of a Christian affects our spiritual well-being. The Philippian believers weren't just struggling with persecution from their neighbors, they were also contending against false prophets within the church. The false prophets were, were trying to draw God's people away from the truth so that they could shipwreck their faith and lead them astray. When you get so down in your Christian existence, you become an easy target for deception. You're looking for some relief, some answer somewhere. So a great part of a Christian's joy is in knowing the truth and in the meditations of our mind. And to cultivate that joy, we need to think on the right things. Paul says we need to think on what is honorable, proper morality, proper manners, proper motivations should dominate the thinking of a Christian. Otherwise, our thoughts give way to the thoughts of the culture. And we begin to respond and live like the culture. And with that goes our joy. If we give in to the temptations of our flesh, we lose the joy of our salvation. So right thinking in the area of that which is honorable 
is a great boon to your joy as a Christian. Next, Paul says that we are to think on whatever is just. The word just indicates those things that are in keeping with the revealed moral will of God. Now, it's very easy to lose your joy in a world in which calls good evil and evil good. So it's crucial for the maintenance of your joy as a Christian to have your mind disciplined by the Word of God, knowing what is right and wrong per the Scripture, not the culture, but by the Bible. And this means that when we know what is right and wrong as a Christian, that we must stand firm, not only in our thinking here, but in our living. Because we're all being drawn astray to this warp and twisted culture of ours and its carnal thinking. It's contrary to the Word of God. Jesus says in John 8, 32, that the truth is the only thing that sets us free. Not only must the meditations of our mind be on that which is true and honorable, but Paul says whatever is pure as well. Now the Philippian church was pri pri uh, primarily or predominantly a Gentile church. And in that part of the world, it was a pagan religious context. They had pagan gods, and the, the, the pagan worship of those gods usually involved sexual morality because it was all geared around fertility. This was the people that comprised the church. They were in that culture that was their lifestyle. Paul preached Christ unto them. Some of them were saved and became Christians. So this was their baggage, if you will. Now to keep them from being tempted by those old patterns of living, they were to sanctify their thinking by meditating on the things that are pure. Not the things from their pagan background. Not the, for us today, the pagan godless immorality of our culture. But on the things of purity that are defined by the Bible. We live in a world that is going in one direction. And it's downstream and it's very fast. The Christian has to swim against that and go upstream. And part of that battle of swimming against the flow of the culture is to have your mind set on the right things. If we don't, then we're going to be swept away in the flood of debauchery that is overcoming our culture. And Paul warns in Ephesians 5, 5, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. To maintain our joy in the Lord. To rejoice always, every day. The meditations of our mind must also be on that which is lovely. This is an interesting word because it's the only time it's used here in the New Testament. At least translated as lovely. And it, it, it describes to set your minds on those things that are agreeable. Agreeable. Not agreeable with the culture. But agreeable with God. To be in agreement on what God agrees with. To love what lo God loves and to hate what God hates. And the hatred of God is a holy and righteous indignation against that which is contrary to His Word. So the culture loves one thing, but God loves another. The culture tends to love that which is contrary to what God loves. And as Christians, we are to love only that which God loves. Paul goes on to say, to set our minds on whatever is commendable, those things that would commend us to worship God. Sometimes there's no joy in our lives because we don't worship God anymore. God is not the, the excellency of our hearts. He is not the object of our affections. We've become... Worshippers of self, seeking that which we desire rather than the things of God. But yet, the scripture tells us that in the presence of God, in Psalm 1611, for example, that in your presence there is fullness of joy. You won't find that in the world, only in Christ. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
No joy. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. We have moved away from God. So Paul summarizes it by saying, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And when we think about the things that God wants us to think about, it cultivates a Christ-born joy within the heart of each believer, enabling us to rejoice always through all that we face in life. And there's one more, and it's crucial. To cultivate joy in our lives, we must be obedient to the Word of God. Verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, notice what Paul says, what you have learned, what you have received, what you have believed as truth, practice these things. Not just sit and listen to these things, Sit and listen to these things, meditate on these things, believe in these things, and then practice these things. And it is only when we practice the things of God that the God of peace will be with you. So many people look at Christianity and, and they see a legalistic response to a set of do's and don'ts from God's Word. As we somehow try to merit God's favor by our obedience. Christian obedience is not a legalistic response to God's Word. Christian obedience is a heartfelt response of love to God for what He has done to save us in Christ. Christ alone merits our salvation, not our performance. Obedience, then, for a Christian is our demonstration of love for Christ. And when there is heartfelt, loving obedience to the Word of God, Paul says the result is the peace of God be with you. And where the peace of God rules the minds and hearts of believers, joy fills their soul. And so this commandment of joy, Paul says, be joyful always in the Lord. This commandment of joy is the duty of every Christian but it is a duty of love. It is, it is the response of worship to God. The joy that supersedes our circumstances is rooted something deeper than ourselves. And while we cooperate and cultivate this joy, it is a supernatural joy that the Holy Spirit brings to bear, which is the joy of Christ Himself. Life for the Christian is a life of worship. And a life of worship is a life of joy. If there is no joy, then there is no worship of God. We have gone astray. If you are a Christian, joy is your duty. We are commanded by Christ to rejoice in the Lord always. Only in Christ can those who live in an uncertain world have certain and lasting joy in their lives? It's a joy that is wrought in the believer supernaturally by the Holy Spirit as we reflect Christ in all of our relationships, pray without ceasing, taking all of our cares to Christ, thinking on those things that are worthy of praise, and to obey the Word of God in all things. We can cultivate joy by doing these four things. Is there joy in your life right now? Not a joy based on your circumstances, but a deep-seated joy. Can you look past the difficulties you're facing right now? Can you look past the pain, the uncertainty, the fear, and look deep within your heart? And within your heart, is there Christ? And is there joy because of Him? Fan into flame that glowing ember of the presence of Christ. There is much that we can do to fan into flame that ember. We've looked at those four things that I've talked about. But look also to this, and we're done. Look to the promise of future glory 
in Christ. <coughs> Knowing that whatever it is you're suffering in life, whatever it is you lose in life, will not compare to what you have in Christ. And let me read Romans 5, uh, Romans 2, chap chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your hard and impenitent hearts, you're storing up wrath for yourselves on the day when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. But Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So without Christ, there is nothing to look forward to but the wrath of God and His justice for our sins. But in Christ, whatever it is you suffer as a Christian, it's not worth comparing, Paul says, to the glory that is to be revealed to us when He comes again. Our joy can be cultivated, present joy can be cultivated by our relationships, how we respond to people, what we give to the Lord in prayer by obeying Him and serving Him and loving Him, but also by looking to the future, knowing what is ours in Christ. Because the world will take from you. It will take from you the people you love. It will take your health from you. It will take all of your peace and all your prosperity. But it cannot take Christ. And Christ has promised you riches untold, that is, by definition, His very presence. Can you imagine that first moment in heaven when all of the suffering and the loss is over and you are there in resurrected, glorified bodies, free from sin and temptation, beholding your Maker, beholding your Savior, knowing that this will never, ever change. Live your lives filled with joy in Jesus, not in your circumstances. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for your word, and our prayer today is that this supernatural joy would be ours in Christ. Help us to look to you, Father. Give us that joy that we need. We can't get it ourselves. We're so running on empty. It has to come from above. Fill our hearts with your love. Fill our hearts with your presence. Fill our hearts with your joy, that we might be a people at peace, and that the world would see Christ in us. In Jesus' name. Number three hundred ten. Three hundred ten.